Okay, and our last talk for this session is Jason Nordhaus, Tidal Disruption and Disk Formation Inside the Cores of Giant Stars. Take it away, Jason. Okay, hold on one second here. Um... Oh, uh, okay, hold on a second. Let's see if I can share now. Uh, did that work? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, so my plan for today was to talk about um, what happens actually when your companion uh, enters a giant star through a CE process or something like that and isn't expected to survive. And so in this case, the binary would, would sort of be destroyed and what would emerge on the other side uh, is sort of a, a single white dwarf. And so, uh, you know, if you think about what systems could do this, it's sort of the obvious, um, obvious suspects here. It's things that are low mass, right? So planets, um, and we know planets are plentiful around main sequence stars. And you know, there's been a lot of work on sort of when planets enter stars and what phases of their evolution and, and, you know, what kinds of planets might survive or not survive. Uh, there's been many papers written on this sort of topic uh, by myself. Uh, Dimitri, I think, has also written a few papers on this. Um, but this plot here basically shows at the time, this was, you know, almost a decade old at this point, um, all the sort of known uh, planet, planetary systems where the, the planet itself was at least a Jupiter mass and the, uh, its, its parent star was at least a solar mass. And if you see a plot here, uh, a point on this graph that's red, what ends up happening is that planet will plunge into its host star uh, and will not survive the evolution. It will be destroyed inside, inside the giant star itself. Uh, if you're if your point here is uh, blue, it will migrate outward to about where these um, where these green dots are, just because of the stars losing mass, and so you're conserving momentum during that process. Um, and so I should say also, this is just for two-body systems. So if you throw like you know five or six planets in there, then things can get you know completely crazy. Some could be ejected, some could could flow into their host stars. A lot of different possibilities uh, there. But whatever the case may be, uh, planets are plentiful around main sequence stars, and some number of these should plunge in their host stars at some point in, in stellar evolution. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, after the star is sort of uh, expelled its envelope and um, we see what emerges from the other side, we, we know that some of, these, some of these objects actually do survive this interaction. So there's a handful of brown dwarfs that have emerged in short period orbits to white dwarfs. Um, there's one planet. Uh, we're, we're here again, my, my definition of a planet is, is something a Jupiter mass or above about. And then Dimitri also mentioned two of these more minor planets um, earlier that, you know, are also could have gotten there maybe through some other method, but, um, but also exist in short period orbits around white dwarfs. So we know, you know, we know some things go in, we know some things can survive, and we know some things are destroyed. But we also know that there are low mass stars, right? So the universe is filled um, with M dwarfs, for instance, um, just because of the IM, how the IMF is weighted. And so you've got large numbers of M dwarfs also that are, uh, depending on how massive their parent star is, they too can plunge in, in uh, during the giant phases and, and some of them will be destroyed and some of them will emerge in short period orbits to white dwarfs. And observationally, we have a much larger sample of those that have survived uh, these white dwarf and dwarf systems that are sort of sh shown on this plot here as these diamonds and circles. And so if you're in this region where you see those things clumping together, uh, you're probably going to survive the interaction and pop out the other side. But if you're anywhere else on this plot, um, and you're not going to be able to survive the interaction and, and you'll be probably destroyed during the process. So why am I sort of interested in the, in the cases uh, where the companion is destroyed? Uh, it's because there's a class of white dwarfs, which are called high field uh, magnetic white dwarfs. And these are extremely, extremely magnetized objects. So these are, are white dwarfs, which at least have a mega gauss field strength, um, but, but some of the measured field strengths for these white dwarfs uh, go all the way up to, um, to 1,000 mega gauss. And so if you think about these as a class of objects, they're basically the equivalent of magnetars for neutron stars. And so neutron stars are, you know, have maybe have measured fields that are on the order of like 10 to the 12 Gauss. Magnetars can go up, um, you know, 10 to the 15 and possibly even 10 to the 16. And what's sort of interesting is that 10% of all white dwarfs are highly magnetized, of field white dwarfs, and also about 10% of neutron stars are magnetars. Although it's sort of interesting because in the high mass case, 
it's, it's potentially a different mechanism for neutron stars that is magnetizing those, those objects and creating those magnetar field strands. But for the white dwarfs, um, you know, the white dwarf mass function is pretty strongly peaked at 0.6. And if you look at the, the mass function for, um, for the highly magnetized white dwarfs, it shifted a bit. It shifted up a little bit from that peak. And there's some data debate about exactly where this is and there's uncertainty in this, but it looks like it's probably maybe somewhere like a half solar mass it shifted relative to, to the, um, the white dwarf, the single field white dwarf uh, mass function. So this gives us some clues as to potentially what's going on. Um, but one of the things you can actually, you can ask, and, and um, this has been asked in the past. So if the origin of these is independent of binary interactions, then you would expect the fraction of these things in the single stars to be the exact same fractions you see in binary systems. And so you can pose that question and you can go actually out and look and, and, um, and surveys of these things have been done, um, most notably by the Sloan. And Sloan detects huge numbers of white dwarf M dwarf binaries that are separated. So they're not interacting at all. They're, they're a little bit, they're far apart. And all of these, they don't find a single uh, magnetized white dwarf in them. Now at the same time, Sloan finds plenty of highly magnetized white dwarfs in the field. And we have a complete census of white dwarfs within about 40 parsecs. And so you can statistically ask the question, if we were drawing these from the same distribution, what are the chances that, what are the chances actually that we're drawing them from the same distribution? And if you do that with all the numbers, and this is in um, this paper, my 2011 paper, you get out that this basically would have to be a six, almost seven signal result um, if you were drawing them from the same distribution. So what this basically says is that like, there's something interesting going on here. Um, with, with the separated white dwarfs and M dwarfs. Now, there's a couple of possibilities. One possibility might be that like the presence of a, a distant companion is somehow inhibiting a magnetic field in the white dwarf, but I can't come up with a good way or reason why that would be. The other possibility is that um, what's actually ended up happening is the, the companions are being removed from the system at some point in time. And so that was this sort of idea that we followed um, that I'll discuss in a minute. There are a couple other proposed scenarios for, for how you create a highly magnetized white dwarf. I just want to mention these three, um, which, and, and then discuss reasons why I don't think any of them, any of the, the first two certainly don't work. But um, the first one is crystallization of the white dwarf as it cools. You can get convection in the interior of the white dwarf, and then you might be able to, you know, generate some strong field down in the, in the center of the white dwarf as it cools. If this were the case, though, you'd see the same I mean, you'd see these things in, in, um, in the M dwarf white dwarf sample, and we don't see a single one there. So I don't think it's, it can't be crystallization of the white dwarf. Um, it's also been proposed that it's a remnant field from single star evolution. But again, if that's the case, you'd also see these things showing up in the white dwarf M dwarf sample, and you don't see any showing up there. So it, it can't be that. White dwarf, white dwarf mergers have been proposed, and it actually may be that there's, a, a, there's some percentage of these that are forming through white dwarf, white dwarf mergers. But remember that I mentioned that the, uh, the mass function is, you know, the average mass is like 0.65 to 0.7. So if you wanted white dwarf, white dwarf mergers to make all of these things, um, then you'd have to, you'd have to all only be merging extremely low mass white dwarfs that are like 0 0.3, 0 0.3. And that seems very unlikely. Um, the idea with the white dwarf mergers is that the two white dwarfs would come together, one of them would be disrupted, there'd be a disk that forms, and then you'd be able to magnetize the white dwarf. And so it, this could be possible for some fraction of it, but it can't, it can't even be most of the sample. It could maybe only be a small fraction of the sample from white dwarf, white dwarf mergers. One other thing I should mention is too, um, there are uh, several of these, I think it's two or possibly three now, have been identified in clusters where we know the turnoff age. So these are in, in globular clusters in the galaxy. And I believe the turnoff age was about three solar masses. So we know at least some portion are also coming from more massive progenitors. But the idea that we had, um, you know, back in 2011 on this project was basically that like, okay, you've got an M dwarf and you've got, a, uh, you've got another star that's gonna evolve. And what if that M dwarf falls in and then, um, or a brown dwarf or planet or some low mass object falls in, then it goes through a CE phase where it, you know, migrates down to the core but if it's low enough mass for, for its parent Jason, star, Jason, yes. three minutes. Oh, geez. Okay. Then it would get disrupted and you form a disk down in the center and then, um, and that would become highly magnetized. And so we did an analytic prescription of this back in 2011. And um, 
some of the, the open questions at the time were like, does the disk even survive? This is not like a disk in typical, that you see in typical astrophysics. It's cold in a very hot environment. So it might just evaporate inside the center of the star. And so um, I, I need to show my picture of my graduate students here, Emily and Gabe. Gabe just graduated. Everything I'm gonna show from this point on is most of his work. Um, Emily's gonna give a talk on Thursday. Here they are in a picture of a common envelope for a Halloween event. But what we ended up doing is um, we did, We've done two computational projects that are um, that have been published, uh, where we put disks down in the center of an AGB star, and we looked at sort of how long those disks survived. And so the first project we did was just with a hockey puck with a mass that was, you know, this one is three Jupiter masses, but we did up to ten Jupiter masses, and we found that the disks survive in this like super hot environment um, for at least ten orbits, possibly a hundred orbits, which would be enough to to amplify a field in possibly transport it to the center if there's a pressure release valve like via a jet or something like that. We recently improved that um, because we wanted to actually follow the tidal disruption of the planet itself. And so this is a simulation of a 30 Jupiter mass brown dwarf um, that, that's sort of just inside uh, where we would expect, just outside where we expect it to disrupt and we let it sort of fall inward around the white dwarf and you can see it, it, it gravitationally tears itself apart um, and the disk forms and um, and fills in the space here very rapidly uh, on basically almost a free fall time scale. Um, and you get in a, a sort of elliptical disk in this case here. But again, the disk here would be long lived too. And so um, these are sort of just initial simulations. I think we haven't put any magnetization in or anything like that just to see like, can you even get a disk that that survives down here for some period of time. And so let me just uh, wrap up here. The connection to PNE is is this, I think. Uh, so first thing for PNE is uh, binary companions can be destroyed. So if you see if you see a, a, a PN and there's no companion, it doesn't mean there wasn't one. And there it doesn't mean that there wasn't one that influenced the evolution. Especially if you see something like an undermassive white dwarf by itself, that's probably a strong indication that there was a companion there that's that's been destroyed. Um, also, once you are tightly disrupted, you can material falls deeper into the gravitational potential and you can tap almost an additional factor of 10 in gravitational potential energy when that happens. So you can probably eject the envelope um, in, in many of these scenarios. And so that's something else to keep in mind for people doing, you know, looking at PN and doing CE. Also, because you're accretion onto a white dwarf um, here, if it occurs late time, maybe when the envelope's gone, there's possibly a nova happening. And uh, I, I, I think um, someone mentioned this morning that there's you know, a few nova that have been seen in, in PNE. But the main connection that I'm sort of interested in is that there are some number of these PNs should have highly magnetized white dwarfs down at the center. Um, and so figuring out what the central objects of PN look like and if there is a, a, you know, a, a mega gauss field strength or more would be extremely interesting. There is one that has a cataclysmic variable and these are where you know it's got actually um, the companion looks like it's survived and it's down in the center and it's actively accreting onto the onto the the white dwarf and this was found in the x-rays um, and so there's at least one case here but i don't know of any cases yet where there's a, a pn with just a white dwarf and that white dwarf itself is highly magnetized but but if this is the pathway for creating those that would be a smoking gun so i'll just go ahead and end there all right thank you very much um all right so we now are into we can both have questions for jason and we can also get into our we have 10 minutes for discussion um so does anybody have questions uh for jason or anything else i think i put everyone to sleep adam <laughs> <laughs> that time of day or night or whatever it is for people. Uh, Albert. Yes, that is more an answer to your question, Jason, about the, the, the novae in the planetary nebulae. There are two known. Uh, one of them is, uh, is pretty certain, and it was quite an old planetary nebula. The other is G.K. Purr, which is not normally mm. classified as a planetary nebula, but the shell really looks like one. And that had a nova about a century ago. And that I think is, is, is a magnetized white dwarf and it is an intermediate polar. And it has a very yeah. shell of considerable size around it. Okay, that's great. 